and welcome to our second episode of Your Quality Life. Today we will be hearing from Caroline Reimer, or Coach Meow, as she's known. She is the head coach here on the Lethbridge Roller Derby team and also uh, two years ago was named as the assistant coach to Canada's national junior roller derby team. Caroline had a very limited exposure to sports growing up and had a pretty large gap uh, between playing a bit of soccer in middle school and picking up roller derby in her 30s. She stands out as an outstanding example of how it's never too late to pick up a sport or how your success or your skill at it immediately uh, is not indicative of whether or not you should continue pursuing it as she has been able to make quite the career out of her experiences with roller derby and, and in so doing uh, touch so many lives around her. Uh, I very much hope that you enjoy listening to this interview and uh, once again if you do have someone that you would like to nominate to be a part of the YQL series please send your nominations to info at lethbridgesportcouncil.ca. Thank you very much and enjoy the interview. All right, um, so I guess we'll start off with, if you don't mind, uh, giving us a brief introduction to yourself and, and what, what you do. Sure, uh, my name is Caroline Reimer and in the Derby verse, I'm known as Coach Meow. I have been involved in roller derby here in Lethbridge for almost 11 years, started in fall uh, 11 years ago. And I have been coaching for nine years and head coach of Lethbridge Roller Derby for five years. And I'm also Team Canada Junior Roller Derby Assistant Coach. And how long have you been uh, on Team Canada as an assistant coach? Two years. Okay. Yeah. Um, Not that we've met as a group because of COVID. So it's all been virtual, which has been very strange. Yeah, I guess that two-year timing is... Uh kind of terrible given everything that's happened in the last uh, 14, 15 months. Yeah, definitely uh, has you reevaluate a lot of things, but. It just builds anticipation to get back at it though, I'm sure. Definitely. All right, um, so uh, how about you talk a bit about um, your relationship with active living and sport growing up and at what point did you get into roller derby? Sure, there's, there's a big time gap in the middle of that, so. Um, when I was little, sports, I lived on an island, so um, we really didn't have sports, we didn't have team sports other than PE, so I um, would go to Victoria for dance, but we didn't play sports. It was sort of, I grew up with older parents where their thoughts were young ladies don't play soccer and sports, they rode horses and danced and stuff like that. So that's what I grew up with until I was about 12. And I ended up moving to Kimberley and also moving uh, back east. And I found a passion for soccer, loved it, um, was able to play uh, in middle school. And then I moved back to the Kimberley area and we lived quite far from town. So sports ended up getting tabled and academics became the priority. So I didn't get back into sports until my early 30s. And uh, it might probably mid to late 20s I was trying to get involved you know they have the beer league baseball stuff here and uh, volleyball so I would contact and reach out because I, I wanted to be active in sports and struggled finding things here in Lethbridge people who were not on varsity when they were in high school and that was like a question that would come up in conversation like oh so did you play in high school oh, we didn't even have baseball teams in high school. Oh, well, you know, we're kind of looking for somebody. I'm like, dude, it's a beer league. Catching and tossing a ball, I can manage that. And it was really uh, discouraging. So uh, roller derby came in at the perfect part of my life. I was 30 and I just had, well, 31, and I just had my second child and I wanted to do something for me. And I heard an advertisement on the radio. And I went to try it, never roller skating in my life. Uh, I rollerbladed because that was cool in the nineties, but that was about all that I had tried. And I was hooked. I spent most of my time on my butt. Uh, there was no, it was like, come and try it. You're kind of fed to the wolves in one sense. You just put the gear on and roller skated around while the actual derby dames got to uh, practice. So you just watched them and tried not to embarrass yourself too much. And I bought my roller skates that night online. 
and uh, been involved ever since. Well, that's uh, that's definitely a bit of a gap in the middle there. Um, definitely, so yeah. If if you had to pick one or or two things, what would it, what was it about roller derby? Would you say that uh, kept you coming back to it after you'd uh, had that first experience with it? It was the uh, community involved behind roller derby that kept me coming back. A group of strong women of all body types and the acceptance that you didn't have to be good in high school. Apparently this whole cloud of high school still follows you into your thirties, which I didn't know existed. You could come and enjoy it. You could come and be part of, of something that was a community and, and they didn't care. They did not care that you suck. They're like, you can take six months to learn how to roller skate and figure out how to play roller derby. We just want you to be part of it. And you, I, developed great friendships, great experience, and it it brought out a strength in me that I didn't know that I had. I was a working mom. I focused on that kind of thing, very academic, but I, I never never knew that I could do the things that I could do in my 30s now, in my 40s, thanks to Roller Derby. That is a really uh, sweet reason to, to get into a sport, for sure. Uh, definitely. Absolutely. Definitely. Yeah, and I think it's something that's missing in a lot of sports is the encouragement to <laughs> that it's okay you suck. There's one percent that makes it into the majors of any sports, into the national teams and that kind of stuff. And you can't beat that into your kids like, oh, you're going to be in the NHL, you're going to be the best, or you're going to make one of the FIFA teams. And why not encourage them to be exercisers for life versus exercisers for the moment? That's been a huge philosophy with my coaching is making exercises for life wanting kids of all types sizes gender inclusion to be who they are and true to themselves and if roller derby fits great and if roller derby doesn't fit it's always going to be there in your life they i've given them a skill that they can do forever absolutely i, I love that i can see now why uh why your name was uh, came up as one that would be so fitting for this uh, series because there's so much more that you can get out of sport than just the competitive aspect of it. There's so many other things it can do for you, but you have to come in with that, uh, that mindset or that approach or the community that you go into has to build that into you. Uh, I know a lot of people who have definitely lost their joy for sport because they had it hammered into them. You're going to make the NHL and if you don't, you're a failure. So. <laughs> this is a great way of coaching. I love it. Keeps people really happy. It's all about having fun. It, it is. I uh, coached, helped coach my son's lacrosse team for a couple of years as well. And uh, of course, it has a very strong personality as well. I knew nothing about it. And I just, I'm not a good parent on the sidelines. I like coaching. I like motivating. And I don't like hanging out with other parents. So I learned how to play lacrosse. And I'm, I'm again, not good at it. But I get to see kind of the a male-dominated sport versus a female-dominated sport. And they were more welcoming of me than I thought that they would be. And also my philosophies and, and my thought behind how to motivate these kids, you know, instead of kill, kill, kill. It was more of a, yeah, that, that works. And you can tell them that they suck at something. But they're 11 years old. And may, maybe let them have a little bit of fun. You know, while they're out there. So it was nice to be able to work with some really top-notch coaches from Western Canada with that and kind of throw my five cents in there going, come on, guys, be kind. I think that's a really important message for them to hear, no matter what level they're trying to play at or, or how old they are, for sure. You've already mentioned coaching a couple of times, so I, I guess we should get into that. Uh, at, at what point did you decide to transition into coaching with roller derby? Uh, my daughter was six and she wanted to play roller derby. That's how I transitioned. I had never thought about coaching before. I mean, I'd done some soccer stuff. My kids played soccer and kids didn't like soccer, much to my, my sadness. So I'm like, okay, fine, let's do roller derby. So I took her to Calgary twice to uh, try roller derby. And I'm like, I'm not commuting to do this. So I got a hold of the... Uh, league here in Lethbridge and kind of approached one of the members and said hey can we start a juniors program I'll get I'll do the background I'll do whatever's needed for paperwork 
and let's try this. And we had a really good response and we still have some of those original kids on our team, which also made Team Canada, which is just wicked. So yeah, that's how I transitioned. It was from day to night. I, I just walked in and started doing it. I wasn't a head coach by any means at the beginning. I uh, shadowed people and kind of got an idea of what coaching was about. So we didn't have really dedicated coaches in our, our women's team. So we would go through a lot of people with different ideas. So I kind of started borrowing ideas, watching a lot more sports on TV and uh, doing some research. And that's kind of where, where I got into it. And then as it progressed. Yeah, that can't hurt at all. <laughs> that's definitely yeah. a fun side. Yeah, and it, it, it brought out a side of me that I hadn't seen before and, and a lot more confidence. I wasn't a strong public speaker and all of a sudden I had to stand in front of 20 parents and pitched the idea of putting their kids on roller skates in a sport that was relatively unknown, going, we don't really know what we're doing, but uh, these are some goals we have and and develop from there. For sure. So uh, would it be fair to say that coaching was not uh, initially a natural transition for you? It was something you not, were to grow into? Not initially, no. It was sort of something that if I wanted to get it done, I'd have to do it myself. So that's what I did, but I believe that with coaching in, in, in any aspect of life, you are as good as the people you put around you. And whenever someone says, oh, you're the head coach, you're such a great coach. I'm like, I'm a good coach because I have great support staff. I have great assistant coaches. I have great people who give me ideas and work with me. I wouldn't be where I am today without them. So got to give them some props. Absolutely. I think that's a, a great piece of uh, perspective to have for sure. Um, you've already mentioned your your philosophy as a coach a, a couple times. So if you don't mind, describe what you what you would say your coaching style or philosophy is, or at least uh, what you would hope that your athletes would say your coaching style is. I think my coaching style is based on acceptance and based on, on um, goal achievement. So I want my athletes, all of them, to think about where they want to be, not just now, not in five years, but kind of what they want to get out of sports in the long run. I have athletes that have made Team Canada, and their goal was to make Team Canada and represent their country. And if you looked at those skaters five years ago to now, what the development has been, and I've, I've had one actually make to a World Cup a couple of years ago, and she's phenomenal. And, and she was able to make those goals with, with support and love from her team. And I think as a coach, it's, it's knowing that winning isn't the only thing. I mean, I love winning just as much as the next guy. And in my head, I'm like, yeah, let's do this. Let's kill him. But I do not pitch that to my skaters. I tell them, we got to play smart. We have to play safe. We have to have fun. And winning is the fourth aspect. Because you can win having the lowest score on the, on the scoreboard if you know you gave 100%, if you gave it all you could, if you win with the best score, but you know you didn't play well or maybe you cheated or you took advantage, that's not winning even though the score tells you that. So as a coach, I really push that philosophy with my skaters so that they understand that in the working world, that's how things happen. You're going to lose because somebody might be better. But how do you take that loss and turn it into a win by maybe doing something better next time? or uh, doing a little bit more research, that kind of stuff. And always putting school first. Uh, education is going to get you further than sports ever will. So making sure that you're finding a passion outside of your sport that you can focus on and maybe they can co be cohesive. And I have skaters now that are older who are now coming back to coach or wanting to learn how to coach. I call it my retirement program. So they're, they're coming in and learning these things because they're motivated about the way that I coach. And when you would look at them, typically you wouldn't see them as coach type people, but we've been able to make them feel that maybe coaching is something that they could do and that they could be good at it. That's, that's really great. I, I, I love that philosophy and uh, I, I love how that uh, you, you can see it shine through uh, your athletes as, as they look to continue their journey into maybe coaching. Um, yeah, it's fun. It's fun to see. Yeah, I'm sure it's really a, a really gratifying feeling too, for sure. Definitely. My athletes have, have really brought out, so I returned to school. So I actually left my position that I was in for 17 years uh, in insurance to pursue uh, a degree in education here at the University of Berkeley. I'm a third year university student. And it's because of that, because of those kids, uh, every single one of them motivated me to go 
back to school, get a degree and, and become a teacher so that I can actually get paid to do something that I didn't realize I was going to be passionate about. So that's, that's something to say too, about being able to use, you know, find a passion in coaching or in sport and then put that into a career to get paid to. That's really uh, incredible that your experience with roller derby has kind of opened that, uh, that door or, or that idea of that possibility for you. And I think you've already commented a couple of times, both for yourself and, and for your athletes, that there's a lot of carryover that you hope their experience with roller derby will have into the working world, into real life. And as a coach, obviously your goal is to help your athletes improve as roller derby competitors, but uh, you have a lot of power to impact their approach to life as a whole outside of, of just the sport, just the, is it an arena? Is it a rink? I'm not sure what, uh, what uh, whatever space we can get our hands whatever, on, whatever space the, the rollerblades are touching down on. Um, yeah, we like any form of concrete available to us. Yeah. We currently skate at the Lethbridge curling club. Uh, okay. and that's one of our biggest struggles as a sport that is in uh, the city of Lethbridge and many other cities feel is doesn't bring enough money, you know, so we, we don't really get a priority placement uh, when it comes to arenas. So we're kind of in the same boat as lacrosse even or roller hockey. And we've been able to team up with one of the parks people here and they're looking at putting two outdoor rinks outside courts that we'd be able to use, which is fantastic, which maybe we'll be up next year, the next year. Right now, once ice goes in, we have we don't have anywhere to play. So it's a real struggle to keep our athletes and, and ourselves motivated when really there there's sometimes nowhere to go to, to focus on. Yeah, it's definitely a, a challenge. I'm sure you're you're kind of nomads just traveling to whoever's available. <laughs> the world take us. Yeah. yeah, some places understand that we don't wreck their floor. I actually was able to take a group of skaters onto the U of L main court mm. and do a demo. Now we had to be no no black wheels, no toe stops. If you wreck the floor, they'll kill you basically. But we were able to go out there and I saw some of my professors from kinesiology and their faces were like, how did you even get permission to put that on a $3 million floor? And I said, because if you listen to the coaches and you actually talk to the athletic director, our materials are the same as running in shoes. They're not any different. We just hit each other. There's <laughs> so it was kind of neat to, to be given that opportunity to put our faces out there in a spot where no one ever thought we'd skate, but we're not allowed on any gym floors. We're not allowed in any schools. And it's just because of fear. They blame the insurance industry, which I used to be part of. So I'm like, you can't blame the insurance people. It's not that. It's not that. We're the unknown quantity, right? So. People are definitely really touchy about their hardwood floors. That's, oh. that's for sure. <laughs> oh, one day. One, absolutely. Hopefully. Fingers crossed. Yeah. Yeah. Going Back to what I think I said before I got confused as to what you uh, compete on. There's a lot of carryover, or at least hopefully there's carryover from what they learn as roller derby athletes to what they do or how they approach real life. And I was wondering if maybe you had a, a story or an example of a, an athlete who you got to see grow, not just as an athlete, but as a, a person during their time with you or with roller derby. Oh, I see them all grow in their own, in their own ways. Um, it's hard to pick someone and, and talk about their story and not cover everybody. I like everybody. Uh, I guess I've had, I've had some successes with skaters who have been able to contact me after they've left and say that it was what we were able to give them in Derby and confidence in Derby that made them successful in life, where they always knew that they could depend on me or a reference or guidance or something to someone to talk to and um, pushing. Uh, if I had to pick one athlete and she always, she always gets picked because really she is a shining star. Her name's Marissa Stalker and her sister played roller derby as well, Madison Stalker. She went on to become a teacher and she's a kindergarten teacher here. Uh, I guess she's up in Claire's home. Thing. So she was part of my own motivation as well with going to school is seeing her successes. 
but her sister Marissa really came through kind of pulling a lot of personal challenges and and being able to exemplify herself as a really strong athlete. So she was able to come through the roller derby program and then be motivated to try out for um, Team Alberta BC. And then she also tried out for Team Canada and really did well at the World Cup. And they took third, so they brought bronze home to Canada, which was great a couple of years ago. But now she's she always comes back. So she always comes back and, and, and is a positive role model for our skaters. She comes back and, and shows them that you, know, you can make mistakes or maybe maybe screw up in a game, but be able to lick your wounds and come back and, and still be a positive uh, person. Uh, that being the best isn't always all it's cracked up to be. And that's something that she's been able to show skaters as well, including our adult team. This, I mean, we, there's a lot of pressure on her to be our superstar. And when that happens, you kind of, sometimes if you fall off that, that pedestal, it hurts. And she's been able to show our skaters and you know, adults and juniors that it's okay. And now she's coming back. Uh, she's been out of town because of COVID, but she's coming back to do a practicum for a pharmacy assistant and she's finding her way. And I think that that's been really good. I don't know if that's the kind of story you're looking for, but. That's a great uh, story. <laughs> but yeah. And I have other athletes who, who've been able just to say that Derby gave them confidence or a place to be themselves. I have juniors that left for you know, whatever reason, 16, 17 year old skaters leave we're coming back to our adult program and skating with our adults and it's just said that roller derby plays a strong part in their life and uh, makes them feel good so why not come back right because we we don't judge you want to leave go experience it uh, we have some of the uh, largest contingents of male skaters because we're an open gender sport so we have a lot of boys at play and then last year I had Two boys who decided, nope, I'm done roller derby. They're kind of uh, junior high age. And I was like, okay. And they have siblings that are still in the sport. And this year they came back. They're like, nope, we want to skate. I said, are you sure? They're like, yeah, we missed it. You know, video gaming wasn't all it was cracked up to. Be. So it was really great to, to know that they, they felt comfortable enough to leave. And I will always talk to any athletes. Parents have asked me to... So you will push them to stay. And I said, I will never push anybody to stay. That's the fastest way to get them out that damn door. So I spoke to them like, you want to go, go. But, you know, we'll miss you. But that door goes both ways. You can always come back, come watch games, come support us. When, once you're part of the team, you're always part of the team. And I think them knowing that, unlike maybe more conventional sports, it's like, oh, you're leaving? And then it's fashion. You've lost your group at school. You've lost your friends online. You know, nobody wants to talk to you now because you decided to pursue something different. Or Derby is like, hey, how's it going? You know, have you thought about, you know, doing something different? Are you playing a different sport? What are you up to? There's no, oh, you quit. No, you just tried something different. I like that. I, I think it's a great problem to have that you like so many people that you've worked with that it's hard to pick a story. And, uh, I think that's great because I've definitely seen it happen with sports where you don't take a year off. If you take a year off, you're retiring. You're you're not a part of the team anymore and you're losing a year's worth of training. So you're never going to be as good as you could have been. So why bother coming back? So I think making sure that athletes understand that doors open both ways is uh, incredible. I'd like to see that uh, in a lot more sports uh, on a lot more teams for sure. Yeah, my daughter speed skates as well. And she did. And she left and then she went back. And she went back for, I think, the wrong reasons, but she went back anyway. And it there's just the stigma and the attitude. And it wasn't that the other athletes weren't kind. It just it is toxic for her. She just was like, well, I'm not as good because I took a year off. And, and now that shows. And she felt a lot of pressure. Now she won't go back at all. And I thought, how, how sad is that? I mean, she CrossFits. She works out. She's a fit person. It's just... Yeah, sometimes it takes a little longer and to get back into something, but there was no motivation to stay. And when she decided to leave, there wasn't one coach who said, why are you leaving? The first time she left or the second time she left. And I, that makes me sad because 
you know, I, I had an athlete contact me last week because if someone who's always been with us hasn't came back, I'll message them, especially the kids. I'm not as good with my adults. It's adults make adult decisions, but kids sometimes need that little person in their ear going, why are you leaving? Where are you going? So I hadn't heard from somebody and uh, I messaged the dad and she messaged me back and she was, well, I just don't know if Derby's the right fit for me right now. And I'm weighing the pros and cons. And I said, well, if you ever want to talk about it, let me know. And well, there's no pressure either way. I was just, you know, we missed you. We were wondering where you were. He could have texted me yesterday and said, no, you know what? I'm, I'm going to focus on volleyball or have a summer off or whatever. And I would have been like, okay, well, keep us in mind for next time. I'm always here. Whereas other coaches would have been like, all right, see ya. Okay, bye. <laughs> or nothing. So I think that that's important to have that connection. And they're, they're like my 30 kids, even the adults. They're like my children. And I protect them from from all the bad things. But I think that also gives them the support that maybe if they don't have that in a teacher or they don't have that in a parent or an aunt or uncle, they know that their coach is going to be there. Even if it's just sitting there going, you know, texting, how are you doing? Absolutely. I, I really like that. I mean, I, I know a lot of people who maybe haven't always had the best uh, home life and, and people in their sports have basically become de facto family members because of uh, what a positive influence they've had on them. And just having someone to be there for you, regardless of the relationship or, or where it comes from, is so huge uh, for sure. Uh, so I think that's a great approach to have as a coach, uh, even though managing 30 kids sounds a, a little challenging. But <laughs> I, I have this year, I'm so blessed. I have five other coaches. So I had five members of my league step up. It's typically, um, I, I have I've usually always had three coaches myself and two others. And because of COVID and life changes, that wasn't happening this year. So another coach stepped up and we had been for the last year doing online, online training, um, outside stuff when COVID rules allowed, trying to keep kids motivated and, and keep them interested in roller skating, or at least getting their skates on and doing something, right? Like do something with yourself. And this, we started finding that if we were going to do the whole program ourselves, we would be coaching you know, 10 to 12 hours a week, which doesn't sound like a lot, but when there's only two of you and it's two days a week, it, it is a lot. So we put a call out and we had two adults and two juniors step up to coach. So now I have six, which I've never had. And I have days off, which I won't know what to do with myself. I still have to take my daughter to practice. So I guess I'll still be there, but in a completely different context. I'll probably sit in my car and not walk at all, but it's it's a really good feeling. And it's a good feeling that I've been able to cultivate that culture that other adults are wanting to be involved in coaching and take training and work with lesson plans and kind of develop. And I think that's really good too. Like I said, it's my retirement plan. Yeah, I, I think it's a pretty solid retirement plan if you're already up to a coaching staff of six. From two. Yeah, no, I just need more skaters. So we just need more skaters. We get more people. Well, hopefully there will be a good number of people looking to pick up sport now that uh, things are slowly starting to reopen this summer. So roller skates are a hot, a hot commodity. You cannot find them anywhere. Really? Wow. There, there's yes, we went through a, a roller skate drought thanks to uh, TikTok. And people doing little videos of oh. themselves on skates and skate dancing. Uh, we have, um, I always get the name wrong, but Martina Emard has, or we call her Cherry Plus. She does uh, skate, uh, roller skate Lethbridge. And she does lessons and stuff. And the stuff that she teaches kind of, and, and the stuff that I teach are a little bit different. But she teaches people how to roller skate and she also skate dances and she teaches that online with Roller Skate Victoria. So it's neat to see people buying roller skates. She sold 14 skates last week uh, locally out of her inventory. There's people out there wanting to learn how to do it. So to be able to give them an option with roller derby is really nice. Uh, you don't have to stick with roller derby. There's lots of other things that you could do, but kind of cool. Yeah, it really is. For sure. I, I hope that uh, you, you guys can find more places to, to buy roller skates for sure. But uh, yeah, we, they're, they're, I bought my daughter's skates last year and it took three months to get them. They were pre-ordered by the shop. 
three months before I bought them. So it was six months to get them in. So it's, yeah, they're, they're hard to come by. They're starting to uh, make them again, but with the shutdowns and everything, it, it affected, you know, the resin and things and the leather manufacturers and the people who make the little bits that go on your skates. Stop making them. So now you have to wait. It'll be good when it's back up, like everything. Like everything. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's for sure. I guess I want to go back a little because you talked about when you first started coaching, you really, uh, you got to, uh, what, what was it, shadow or mentor that you said, and you picked up uh, coaching from from watching other sports. Uh, so coaching, just as much as it's about teaching, it's also a learning journey for you, the coach. So I, I was wondering if you could talk a little about some things that you've learned about coaching or, or about yourself in, in your journey as the, the coach here. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, when I started coaching, we, we really didn't have anybody. But there is um, my, my best friend now. She wasn't then, but my best friend now, uh, Heather Herman. She was part of um, our league and she's a very strong personality and she was able to sort of get going and she'd been involved in roller derby since the beginning here in Lethbridge so it was really nice to have her as one of the coaches and then we had parents who were part of roller derby who stepped in a lot of us kind of watched what she did and then we would have different coaches leagues or boot camps that we go to that we watch coaches and be coached by them so as an athlete because I didn't stop playing roller derby until about five years ago so I took on the head coach hat and I stopped playing because I like my head too much banging it sucks so I uh, decided not to play but I'm still an active roller skater so I skate on skates and I still benchmark with them but I started watching like basketball which I never had interest in uh, just for philosophy and then probably the biggest mentor that I've had and it wasn't necessarily a roller derby mentor and it happened probably about four years ago is Russ Shepard and he's my my cousin, but he coaches lacrosse and he's been involved in lacrosse for a really, really long time. And he found lacrosse when he was a teenager and then he became really passionate about it and saw how it opened up lives and gave opportunity to athletes. And I started really pulling on how his thoughts were with with kids, motivating them to play and finding their own inner passion for sport and their own strength by being a strong mentor. So instead of being shy, which I am, <laughs> or I was, and and um, being reclusive, it's it's getting out there, it's talking to people, it's getting to know the people that are on your team, it's putting yourself in an uncomfortable situation and, and making it a positive. And Russ has been able to give me so many tips. I um, got my developmental coaching through him out of Cranbrook, he coaches in Cranbrook. And yeah, it, it's just been really a really great opportunity to use him as a as a mentor. And I, I I listen to different podcasts. I'm bad at names, just kind of turn them on and and listen. But a lot of them have to do with you know, just being strong in sport and being positive. I also believe in dressing for success. So as much as I want to be more approachable with the kids, and I'm way more approachable at practice when it's game day, game face on. I'm representing a league and a group of athletes. I dress professionally and I want the kids to think that way as well. Take pride in your sport, take pride in how you look and show up and as a strong person, not, you know, five minutes late, lunch down your shirt, yelling at your mom. Because I'll call kids out if they're disrespectful um, and I will call them. Yeah, I call them out. So I make them apologize if they're mean to their mom or dad teammates you gotta be nice so I think it's just Russ has given me that that idea of mentally supporting the kids and making them feel positive about themselves and then as a coach I've been able just to develop that and bring that in with my coaches hey guys it's game day I don't want you wearing leggings and a t-shirt like if you want to wear a jersey that's absolutely fine but let's dress it up a bit let's look professional and it's funny the other coaches look at you like what do you what are you wearing I'm like, oh, I'm wearing a suit. These are heels. And yes, I will run around the track in them. But for me, it shows a, a sense of pride. And and I think the kids get some respect out of that too, that coach, coach looks like that because she wants to look good for us and represent us. 
I think that's really important. Hockey, basketball, they do that. Um, lacrosse, we would wear our you know, nice, nice pants in our, our jersey or t-shirts or whatever. And I think that it just shows a, a respect and that's important too. That's a really, uh, I think a powerful thing that a lot of people miss on is, is just what a profound difference your appearance can make uh, both in what you wear and your, your body language, how, how you, what level of reverence you treat the, the sport you're being involved in, the, the game you're attending, the competition you're at. And I think it's great to have uh, your younger athletes seeing you as that, uh, that example of this is special. This is how we treat this. And uh, yeah, and it sounds like you had a pretty good uh, mentor to get you uh, to get you going. For sure. Yeah, Russ is pretty great. Um, on his side note, he had um, the movie The Grizzlies came out just before COVID. And um, it's a story about Russ, actually, but up in Kugluktuk and how he brought lacrosse into a community where there's a lot of youth suicide. And then giving them so many things and, and what those athletes gave, gave him, those students gave him as a teacher. It's just profound and that I, I pull a lot of his strengths from that and I, I lucked out he's my cousin so we would we watched a preview of the movie together and it took us four and a half hours to watch the movie because so he would pause it and then tell us the actual story behind the movie and what had happened and I think that also changed my attitude quite a bit with acceptance and it, not that it changed it, but it just made it stronger and how you accept everybody and everyone has a strength to bring to a team. And our motto this year is everybody welcome. So in two words for Derby, because it really is everybody. It doesn't matter. And uh, I think the sport we need to get, we need to get away from that perfect ideal because you don't have to be perfect and roller derby allows you to be imperfect in your perfect self. I love that notion. I think that's such a great uh, uh, slogan for, for the season, for sure. I mean, it's like you said earlier, only 1%, even if that is probably a fraction of 1%, will ever make it to the top level. So what about the remaining 99 point whatever percent? Are they just supposed to be miserable or think of themselves as failures when there's so much else you can gain and get out of uh, your experience with whatever it is that you pursue, whatever sport you're involved with? Sure. Absolutely. And uh, I think that exercises for life should be a philosophy that everyone should embrace. You don't have to be the best. I mean, it's great to be the best, but I know I'll never be the best. Most of my Team Canada, all my Team Canada kids can skate laps around me, but they don't make me feel bad for it because I'm still active. I'm, I'm in better shape now than I ever was in my 20s and early 30s because they motivate me to do better. They motivate me to try to keep up. Um, not that I ever will, <laughs> but yeah, it's, they, they've given me a lot, a lot of things as much as I give them. And I think if we can make more kids think about being active in whatever they want to be active in forever and just pull that through their entire life, I think we'll have less, less obesity. We'll have less eating disorder disorders positive body imaging, like it's so important. And, and I think kids need those positive role models around them. There's so much negative, even though there's positive on TikTok and the positive body imaging, but it blows my mind. It's the skinny people saying, be positive about yourself, right? Always, and, yeah. <laughs> uh, um, my daughter's like, but it's the, the skinny ones are saying that. And she's like, I'm built like a rugby player. And I'm like, I know you are. She's like, that's not what they're promoting though. And I'm like, be, but you have to feel good about yourself. And there's just so much negative out there. So I'm glad that we're doing what we're doing with the league and hopefully more people will see that. For, for sure. Yeah. And that was kind of a question I had um, is that you talk a bunch about the, the culture of roller derby and, and how acceptance is, is such a huge thing. And I wonder, do you think that roller derby being a relatively new and I guess less mainstream sport has contributed to having this uh, unique culture, this really accepting culture. What what is it about roller derby that you think ha has given it this kind of uh, approach to its athletes and to its community? Well, I think that it's um, come back in the early two thousands and it was a beautiful movie, Whip It, 
likes to really promote <laughs> promote that. And that's not what we do at all. <laughs> but initially it gave it gave women a strength that they didn't have before. And it gave them the power to dress the, the way they wanted to and have this persona of their name. Because that's one of the, the cool things you get to do when you're in roller derby. You pick your own name. And it means whatever you want it to mean to yourself. And not many people change their names over the years, but they'll they'll pick them and and stick with them. And that's who they are. And no other sport gives you that. They don't, you don't get to pick who you want to be that day and you had to dress the way you wanted to as we've developed over the years maybe there's less fishnets than there were before and we have uniforms now not t-shirts that have been shredded and tied up and all sorts of things but you can still do that and that was the fun part it allowed you to express yourself the way you wanted to express yourself which conventional sports doesn't let you do um, the fans get to be those crazies, but you are in this uniform and you're representing this and everybody looks the same and this is the body type. And with roller skating and roller derby, you need the little guys as much as you need the big guys. And it, it's a team advantage to have strong, larger skaters in some aspects than it is to have the tiny little ones. I mean, I got hit, I'm 5'5", five five, and I got hit in the chin that a few concussions I think that game from this super tall girl's shoulder and I was down low and she'd come down and swoop me right into the chin and yes it was an illegal hit but she did it anyway it hurts right and but it didn't matter in the sense that you know every size matters because you need everybody in there but it, it wasn't all the same in so many sports they you know you get the lineup and they're all just about the same it's very cookie cutter and roller derby is definitely not cookie cutter also being uh, open gender we give the opportunity to anyone wanting to play because we don't care what your gender is when you come through the door we we just see an athlete you you have your name and maybe if you're discovering yourself or you're figuring out where you sit or feel or how you identify that name is who you are and it doesn't matter anything else, you know, your pronouns, of course, but we'll use your name and we call skaters friends and we call skaters skaters and we keep it as an open term. And I think that there's, there's less feeling that you don't fit in with us. I don't know if I'm answering these right, but oh, I, I think you're doing fine. Yeah, I think okay. fitting in is hugely important for sure. Absolutely. Um, I, I like that. I like that. That, that community just sounds wonderful to be perfectly honest it sounds awesome but we have intake on the 23rd if you're interested <laughs> well <laughs> hopefully hopefully people will uh hear this or, or, or read the article that comes out of this and definitely uh, circle that date on their calendar i've got a, a track career at the university that's uh taking up a bit of my time right now that's for sure but i it, understand yeah, yeah. so Maybe if you could talk a little about your opportunity to get on the coaching staff for Team Canada uh, two years ago. How, how did that uh, come around? Um, it was my goal. So when I started coaching and get serious about coaching, I was like, man, would it be wicked to coach a national team? Like to be able to represent a country in a relatively unknown sport and <laughs> prove to everybody I could do it. And it's just a challenge to myself. Uh, I was able to get to know our um, junior uh, roller derby association rep, uh, Dave Morris of Vancouver. And he's also a coach for NWA, which is a roller derby league down there. And he was able to mentor me in a way as well to kind of get my head around what expectations of a national level coach would be. And I was able to share my philosophies. What I also did was uh, host the first round table for Western Canada here in Lethbridge, which kind of put me on the map as a coach as well, that my interest in the, the development of our sport nationally was really important. Um, so when the call out for, because we were governed up until I think last year by the U.S. governing body, and we were just a, a part of it. Uh, now we have the JRDA Canada, which governs us, but before it was a call out from the U.S. So when the U.S. called for Canadian coaches, myself and uh, Jen Davis, 
who um, is one of our coaches, she applied as well. And both of us were accepted. It was the best. I was camping. It was over a Canada Day weekend and I was not in cell phone service. And Dave texted me and said, you need to be in cell phone service. And I'm like, I, I don't have reception. I'm in the mountains. And he goes, you're going to need to find it. And I was like, okay, I'll keep my phone on. So one spot of our campsite, I could get texts and he's like, call me now. And I drove, drove my dirt bike up to the top of the mountain and got the call that yes, it isn't official yet, but I wanted to be the first one to tell you that you were accepted. And I I was, there was two national teams and to be selected for one of them was just mind blowing. Just, it was really priding and priding in the sense that our, our athletes could see that, that two of us, which no other league in Canada had two coaches make either of the teams and to be able to represent Lathbridge and put us on the map and then have, after we had uh, four tryouts nationwide and we had six athletes from our junior program make Team Canada. So one for the female team and five for the open team. It was, that that just made it even better. But for me, it was a personal goal to coach a national team, then COVID hit. So trying to keep the kids motivated, trying to connect with them. Our teams still have not met in person. So they shut down our tryouts were, or our first practice was right after COVID uh, restrictions came down as a team. So our kids have never all met. And uh, then World Cup was canceled for this year. So, so many of them had aged out. So at the age of 18, they can no longer skate. So they postponed it for one year depending on what would happen. So they were planning on hosting it this year, but again, restrictions, they decided not to as other nations couldn't. So now all those kids have to try out again, but, and, and coaches as well, will have to reapply as a national coach. Definitely going to do that. Yeah, for sure. Well, I, I hope you get uh, re-accepted. I can't think of a more uh, cinematic way to get a call saying that you've been selected to Team Canada than <laughs> dirt biking to the top of a mountain to receive a phone call. <laughs> Yeah, it was pretty, it was pretty epic. And then being put on mute, basically, I couldn't tell anybody until they did a national, like the proper announcement. So Jen and I could talk about it, but we couldn't tell anybody. So I was camping with one of my athletes and her dad and stepmom. It was the hardest thing because I couldn't celebrate. I could I could say nothing. So I'm sitting there like the cat who ate the canary <laughs> and I could say nothing. And you know, I could tell my family and, and that was great, but we couldn't really celebrate until they left. And <laughs> so then it was, it was a really pride moment. And, and it gave me, when I got my team jacket, so we don't have our uniforms yet, but when I got my team jacket, it was just a really pride moment to be able to put on our national colors and, be like that's I earned that that wasn't just given to me I didn't get pulled out of a hat I had to apply and earn it and that was really awesome uh, that is awesome that's to set a goal and to achieve it especially such a lofty goal is uh, really incredible I, I'm sure that the feeling was just indescribable it is yeah it's pretty great I just look forward to actually be able to coach in a world cup at some point and bring home a medal that would be great too yeah well so, next step right yeah next step <laughs> get every get get everyone out playing get get it up and going but we've been lucky with Uthbridge we we have really good skater retention um and athlete retention and people want to stay and play and and they set their goals and our, our older kids that make the team and they range between well when they made it they were anywhere from 12 13 years old the 17 and those those athletes are still many of them are still with us so their goal is to make the next round right to to try out again and then we have the younger ones who see that and now they've aged into the right spot so and they want to try out too and we tried out as a team which wasn't necessarily as a I don't know I don't know if other leagues looked at it that way but our skaters we all went together so even though I was judging them and I was doing the evaluations I kept that separate but when I was there as their coach we were we'd motivate them and they went in as a group to support each other and I said we're doing this all together and not everybody's going to make it and that's okay 
but we started this adventure together. We're going to end it together. Uh, a couple of skaters didn't make it. And um, that was a really hard pill to swallow, especially when we had so many that did. But I'm like, your potential is still there. Here are the things that you could work on. So I was able to meet up with one of the athletes and, and talk to her after and say, hey, yeah, you didn't make the team. And that sucks. And I get that. Here's why. But here were all the positives that you did. Like, look at where you started and where you came out. You know, you weren't far from making it. You just weren't there yet. And I think that's important. Super important. Yeah. Well, and to, to have so many make it and to have the ones that didn't realize that they train alongside people that did make it every day, it should make it a little easier to deal with, I would imagine. Yeah. Or, it's hard. I won't lie. Yeah. It's hard. It's hard to see. It's hard to watch. And there is a provincial team that started up right after Team Canada and a lot of skaters applied for that. Too. And the ones that didn't make Team Canada made, made that provincial team. And a lot of the Team Canada kids made it as well. And that was really good for, for those who didn't make it you know, to get the chance. But when COVID hit, everything blew apart. We our new governing body. So all of our sanctioning and rankings and everything is now changing. So hopefully roller derby will become more popular so that we won't have to travel as far to play higher level teams. As we brag a little, we're ranked really high in Canada. So the ones that really would matter to play are either West Coast or East Coast. Then to bus the you know, 20 kids to New Brunswick to play is not really financially able to happen I guess yeah. I just haven't bought that bus yet so yeah <laughs> stuck in the middle but uh still yeah. highly ranked yeah That's... yeah it's it's a good feeling but everyone's going to be starting out at zero again which I think is good we're all starting out fresh and uh, our our kids are ready to go like they can't wait we're just starting contact um in the next couple of weeks again so that'll be good Otherwise, they've just been skating and working on their skills. So to be able to actually hit each other again will be really, really good. I think it'll relieve some of the stress. I'm sure. Yeah. Oh, it depends on the athlete. But I imagine it's quite motivating to come in with everything kind of reset to zero because uh, you get a chance to prove that you are highly ranked. You know, that is actually your quality as a team. It's got nothing to do with any uh, biases in the rankings. It's how good your team actually is yeah there's we're like i said i'm lucky that everyone's coming back everyone's wanting to play many of them kept up doing something during the last year and a half so if we did workouts online with skaters i guess up until july i did online workouts with them once a week and they were based on the team canada so team canada kids had to do it but my my thing is, is I'm going to make you do it. I'm going to do it too. So I, I led the workouts with them and it was on Facebook because I didn't have a zoom account and they would always take more than an hour. So it was Facebook live. So it was them watching me and I couldn't see what they were doing. It was terrible. I'm like, I'm sure that most of you are just sitting there watching and laughing, but <laughs> yeah, at, at least I'm there giving, giving you some sort of instruction. And a lot of the kids would follow after and some of the adults did as well. We kept it as a league, like an open thing to the league so that they could all uh, pay attention and chime in when they wanted to and just try to keep people motivated because we couldn't get together. And then we could last fall for a bit. So I think we practiced for a month and we were just, just starting to get things rolling again when they shut us down. So we've started up and that, that's been really hard for me as a coach and physically, emotionally, Mentally, all of it, I have struggled with it. And especially this last group of shutdowns, it made me reevaluate. Do I even want to do this? Do I have the energy to do this again? But just seeing the kids last Sunday for our first practice back, seeing our promo videos, their excitement to be part of it again, it just was like, oh, this is a no brainer. This is where I belong. But there was times where I had a lot of self doubt of whether or not I had the power to to do it one more time. I think that's yeah. a, a common theme for a lot of people dealing with one shutdown after another, after another, but it seems like we're seeing some light at the end of the tunnel here. So that's very, uh, it's, it seems so. Yeah. It's uh, it's been really good. Um, and it's been good for, for the kids to, to be able to come back and 
I'm just, I, I'm excited to get them actually playing roller derby again. And we have such good numbers that, you know, we, we hope that other leagues will be able, like, maybe in the fall, if we have a place to skate in the fall, um, we'll be able to maybe play games again, like to get out there and actually have a game, which would just be awesome. That yeah. would be for sure. Um, yeah. Hopefully, yeah. Hopefully. hopefully. No more shutdowns. No more. No more shutdowns. Bandwagon. My mental health and everyone else's mental health need needs sports. We gotta keep doing this. We have to keep keep active. I it's you see the difference when people don't get to exercise. Yeah. Absolutely. Need this. No, I, I I would agree. I, I'll hop on that bandwagon. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> Um, so for you, I mean, we talked at the very beginning that you had a pretty big gap in the middle when it came to your uh, experience with sports. Uh, would you say that's something that happens a lot with some of the athletes you see coming to roller derby? Is it something that uh, you wish people would consider more often? Like if they haven't competed or, or been active in a sport since high school or middle school, but they want to, they should still get involved in, in your opinion? Absolutely. For me, getting involved in it, it changed my life. So, you know, the, the mantra roller derby changed my life is actually an accurate one for me. Um, but I think of it even as a young adult or as um, a youth, if I had had something like this to connect with, I think it would have really impacted my life as well, uh, just because of the community that supports and maybe, maybe I'm just lucky with the community that I have um, that it's been able to help me so much. But I think that people forget that sports or being active is important and it's okay to choose something that fits you and not necessarily what fits everybody else. I mean, my parents thought I was crazy for even wanting to do this. My in-laws thought I was crazy. Everyone was like, why would you go do something like this roller derby? Do you not remember what it was like in the 70s? I said, I, I wasn't even born. <laughs> and they, they were telling me all about what it looked like and how it was this big WWE production. And I'm like, well, that's not what it is now. I think that if, if people were even slightly thinking about getting involved in sport, they could. And I, I wish that locally sport was more welcoming people that are coming back to it and that the uh, prerequisites weren't there like hey you you want to play well just come play just because you didn't do it when you were a kid doesn't mean you can't do it as an adult so I think that that stigma needs to be removed for pretty, sure pretty quick yeah I, I, I'd love to see that I, I completely agree with the with that sentiment and, and would you say that, that is probably the biggest thing that you wish other sports would learn from roller derby and, and its culture? Absolutely. Um, if it isn't for our acceptance of everybody, I think it should be that, that just because they don't fit in your cookie cutter expectations, it doesn't mean that they aren't going to be a benefit to your team. And people bring different skills, different attitudes, different abilities, but everybody, when you put it together, you have a really good package. I always bug about my older kids that skate and, and they are so in sync because they've skated together so long, nine years of, of learning how to play roller derby together that before someone sneezes, a Kleenex will come out because they know what's <laughs> going to happen, right? Like they, they have this ability to behave like that and to have that through an entire group of kids and none of them go to school together. None of them attend parties together. They are trying to do stuff outside of Derby, but realistically, they aren't in the same friend groups or anything. Like when I went to school, that was just the one school you went to. So everybody knew everyone. But here we have people from out of town that come in and, and locally in different high schools, and they still come together and are a cohesive team. And I think that's a really big thing that is missing in sport that I see that this cohesiveness isn't there. If you don't have that group that sticks together all the time or these specialized schools that do certain things, you know, then you're just not going to make it. And I think that ends up becoming a mental thing with adults wanting to join a league. I wish more women, 
I, I don't have enough fingers and toes to count how many people said, I wish I could do what you do. I wish I could join roller derby. I said, why can't you? What's stopping you? Well, I'm not very good. And I'm like, I sucked. I, you want to see footage? I have footage. I was terrible. And they're like, but you just have confidence. And I said, it gave me confidence. There's so many roadblocks that we put up in front of ourselves that are so, that's so unnecessary. Anybody can come try it. Anybody, like, are come and try it night. Anybody can come and try it. Anybody. We have stuff for you to try. See, see if you like us, you know, try us on. But I think that that's something that people need to get, get over. They need to have enough confidence in themselves to just to try it once and, and see. Totally agree. Yeah. I mean, every fire starts with a spark, right? I, I think people so many times just look at really talented athletes or people that are really successful and just see them as a finished product as opposed to a someone who has taken time and years and, and gradual steps to get to where they are. That is uh, definitely something people need to be uh, more cognizant of for sure. Yeah. And it's, we're, we're all a, a beer league in some sense or another, right? I mean, nobody in my, my age bracket is jumping into a sport and going to the Olympics necessarily, right? Like it's not our goal it's to find a group of people that we can work with and with you know, spend a couple couple nights a week doing something with it we like and learning how to do it. We tried to make ourselves more professional in some aspects and we pushed people away that way. You know, trying to focus on, we wanted to be better. We had people who wanted to be you know, the best team in Alberta or the best team wherever for our adults. And that pushed skaters that maybe weren't as good away because they felt they just didn't make the cut. And that's something I, I wish I had done and I learned from that. We have to we have to remember that everyone has lives outside of their sports and there could be reasons why they're not performing the way that they should be or attending the way that they should be. So being a little bit more accepting there. Absolutely. That's such a, a great perspective to, to keep in your head as a as a coach for sure. Well, looking forward now as hopefully things reopen and we're able to get back to it. Um, uh, what would you say your plans are or what the plan is in general for Lethbridge Roller Derby in 2021-22? Um, big picture wise, if everything stays the way that it's going, uh, we will be skating up until the end of July. We have space. Then we'll take August off. We always give, give people time to enjoy summer. And then as long as we can find a home for the fall, it's keeping our development going and getting some game play in. Roller Derby has an opportunity to play a short track version of the game, which basically fits in a basketball court. Um, so the rules are a little bit different, but it might give us the opportunity as a smaller league and other leagues are going through the same growing pains that if we can't roster a full, full group of skaters that we could maybe play a short track game instead. So it's keeping opportunities open to our athletes for gameplay and interleague play if, ne if necessary. We don't quite have the numbers, but Maybe we can make something work and developing into 2022. Our goal is to have three travel teams, uh, lower level, one, two junior teams. So they're the entry level. So if you look at it as like a novice type team and then our level threes, which would be a little bit more advanced travel team uh, for rankings and then an adult travel team. So we're, our goal is I'm always ambitious to, to hopefully have this next year. And then uh, kids trying out for Team Canada. Again, that's a, a big thing. And having it as a team support so that like we did last time is we do it as a team. Everyone should try out, get experience and uh, and just develop, get out there, get in the public eye as well. That's something we really are trying to do is get ourselves out there let people know that there's opportunities for your your children and yourselves to uh, try something different. I like that. That sounds like a good plan. I, I really hope that uh, everything goes relatively smoothly going forward. Though, really. Oh, thank you. Anything is an improvement over uh, what the last 12 months have been. That's for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. I think we've been going for over an hour. So, I, I, and I think that was my full list of questions. So thank you very much for your time today, Caroline. Oh, no problem. My pleasure. And that is all that we had for our interview with Caroline Reimer. Uh, thank you, Caroline, if you are listening, for taking the time to uh, 
participate in this interview with us. It was an absolute treat getting to talk to you. And uh, thank you for, uh, for listening, everyone out there who has uh, taken an interest in this series and uh, has listened to this episode and hopefully our first one with Chantelle Erickson. Going forward, once again, if you do have someone that you would like to nominate uh, to participate in this series, please send your nomination email to info at lethbridgesportcouncil.ca. Thank you very much, and I hope you will join us for our next episode.